Let's put that to the test. Do you think you've kept the Ten Commandments? Um, I don't think I know all of the Ten Commandments, but uh, I'm sure... Uh... What ones can you name? Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. Well, let's do them one at a time. Okay. Have you ever killed anyone? No. Have you ever hated someone? Uh, yeah. The Bible says, he who hates his brother is a murderer, so you've committed murder in your heart. If I were to ask you directly, are you a murderer at heart? What would your answer be? And how would your answer be affected by the mere virtue that somewhere, sometime in your life, you once felt anger towards another human being? Does that really make you a genuine murderer? No, of course it doesn't. The idea is absurd beyond all reason. So what is it about this conversation that compels a man to happily agree to the accusation of murder? Consider the following experiment. Suppose next Monday morning you receive a phone call from a man claiming to represent an organization called the California Consumers Group. The reason this man is calling is because he would like to know if you are willing to participate in a survey regarding the various household products that you use daily. All he needs is two hours of your time and free access to your home while a group of, say, five or six men rummage through your stuff and take inventory. Now, obviously, this is a wildly intrusive request, so it is no wonder that only 22% of the subjects agree to take part in the survey. Now, let's shake things up a bit. Suppose that instead of rummaging through your stuff, the surveyor wants to know if you would be willing to answer a few basic questions over the phone about which brands of soap you use to clean your kitchen. That's not so bad, right? Answer a few questions, thank you for your time, and you're done. Three days later, the gentleman contacts you again and asks to take another survey. All he needs is two hours of your time and free access to your home while a group of, say, five or six men rummage through your stuff and take inventory. In all respects, this is exactly the same unreasonable request as before. The only difference is that it has now been preconditioned by an agreement three days prior to answer eight mundane questions about soap. Surely, such a flimsy pretext would have no effect on compliance, right? Wrong. The mere act of securing a minor agreement more than doubled the success rate for the intrusive request. This is the basis for what is called the foot-in-the-door technique. The probability of generating compliance with any request is greatly increased when agreement is first secured to a much smaller commitment. Ever stolen anything? Yes, I have. So what do you call someone who steals things? Uh, a thief. So you still think you loved your neighbors yourself? You've hated someone, committed murder in your heart, and stolen from your neighbor? Have you ever lied to someone? Um, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I think all these traits, you know, humis humanistically, we have done one time or another. Uh, not saying that I do these things now. How many lies have you told in your life? Uh, I probably couldn't count. <laughs> so there's a lot. So what do you call someone who tells lies? Uh, a liar, usually. So you're a lying thief? Sure. <laughs> So here's a quick summation. Chris, by your own admission, you're a lying thief, a blasphemer, an adulterer at heart, a fornicator, and a murderer at heart. Let's examine another experiment. Suppose you are a freshman student in Psychology 101. As part of an extra credit assignment, you are invited to take part in an experiment on thinking processes. All you have to do is show up at the perfectly reasonable hour of 7 a.m. on a school day. Piece of cake, right? No, of course not. Very rarely is any college student going to drag himself out of bed at 7 a.m. just for a few measly extra credit points. So it is no surprise that only 24% of the students actually complied. Now, let's shake things up a bit. Rather than be frank about the unreasonable hour, suppose we first secure a verbal agreement to participate in the extra credit work before bringing up the 7 a.m. time frame. Again, in all respects, this is exactly the same request as before, but with a minor rearrangement in when information is given. Surely, such a minor detail would not elicit greater compliance to a 7 a.m. experiment, would it? Wrong. By waiting until after a verbal agreement has been reached, compliance with the 7 a.m. time frame nearly doubled to 53%.
This is the basis for a technique known as lowballing. The probability of generating compliance with a request may be dramatically increased simply by waiting until after an agreement has been reached before revealing the hidden cost. Let's do another one. Consider yet another experiment. Suppose you are at a bake sale and stumble across the following offer. One cupcake and two cookies for the low, low price of 75 cents. Sounds like a real bargain, right? So it is no surprise that 40% of control subjects took the deal. Yummy. Now let's shake things up a bit. Suppose you come across the following offer. One cupcake for 75 cents. No wait, hang on a second. My mistake. That's supposed to be one cupcake and two cookies for 75 cents. Once again, this is exactly the same offer. The only difference is that I have artificially inflated the value of the offer by starting with the cupcake alone and then adding the cookies to it. Surely, no one is stupid enough to fall for such a cheesy ploy, are they? By now, you probably see what's coming. By simply offering the cookies on top of the cupcake, 73% of subjects took the offer. This is the basis for what is known as the that's not all technique, where the probability of compliance is greatly increased simply by artificially inflating the apparent value of the offer. At this point, one painful fact should start feeling very apparent, namely, people are suckers. And I'm not just talking about kids and old ladies here. This applies to everyone, you, me, your neighbors, your friends, your family, Everyone. All of us are suckers to varying degrees. Worse yet, these techniques are just a tiny sampling of the various methods by which people can manipulate the compliance of their fellow human beings. Anyone who would knowingly employ such tactics is nothing more than a marketer trying to sell something. So how does such research apply to matters of faith? Is this the kind of man sharing valuable knowledge with an evidentiary basis in reality? Or is this man nothing more than a clever salesman attempting to generate belief through methods that are well known for their power to instill compliance? And what does this say about this poor dope right here? Is this guy being won over by the power of the holy inspired word? Or is he just another patsy falling victim to textbook psychological manipulation? Let's put that to the test. Do you think you've kept the Ten Commandments? Um, I don't think I know all of the Ten Commandments, but uh, I'm sure... Uh, what ones can you name? Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. Well, let's do them one at a time. Okay. Have you ever killed anyone? No. Have you ever hated someone? Uh, yeah. The Bible says, he who hates his brother is a murderer, so you've committed murder in your heart. Uh, what was that other one you said, you shall not steal? Shall not steal, yeah. Ever stolen anything? Yes, I have.